Let us pray. God, as we sing our praises this morning, giving glory and honor and praise to you. We are reminded that it is your spirit that enables us to do so. May that same spirit enable there to be more of you and less of me in the words that I say and more of you to abound in our lives as a, as a consequence of that. We give you glory, God. We give you honor. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, I was walking through the mall the other day and I was taken by surprise. The Christmas decorations are already beginning to go up. It seems earlier and earlier each year um, we are preparing for Christmas. Of course, the way the mall prepares for Christmas is to help the shopkeepers and to get the economy flowing because now is the time that our economy buys things in order to give to others. The giving is a good thing. The buying can often put a lot of pressure on folks. Um, Within the Christian calendar, we are leading up to what the church calls a season of Advent. And so our scriptures are beginning to prepare us for the Advent season. The word advent literally means coming, uh, and so we're adventing towards advent. We're coming towards the season of the coming of Christ. Last week, we looked at some passages that talked about the Christian tradition as a moving train, that the stories that have helped shape who we are have already left the station, and our call is to take that leap of faith and to hop on. We don't get to choose the direction of the train, we get to choose to be faithful. This week, we're going to be looking at how that train is described, not so much about the place we left, but the place we're going to. And the way that that is written about in scripture is often called apocalyptic literature. I'm going to be talking a little bit about what that means in a few minutes, but I want to begin by looking at that parable, just very briefly, that we read in the New Testament about the ten bridesmaids, or, or in the Greek, the, 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 the literal word is the, the ten virgins who are waiting the return of the bridegroom. Often when we read Scripture, it's hard to tell what's going on at times. Images are used in Scripture that can be a bit confusing. Sometimes we don't know whether this is a metaphor or something that we should take literally. Some passages it's easy to work out. When Jesus says, I am the vine, or I am the gate, we realize he's speaking metaphorically. He's not a literal vine, he's not a literal gate, but there's something about a vine, or there's something about a gate that has characteristics that Jesus is trying to explain to us. When Jesus prays to God as Father, that can be a bit confusing. Is that a metaphor or is that literal for Jesus? And we are invited into that conversation. When Jesus tells parables about the ten bridesmaids awaiting for the bridegroom return, we're invited into this story to understand what the symbols might mean for us and what the message might be for us. And the beauty of a really good parable is it's never clear. The whole point of the parable is we're meant to have those conversations internally and with others in the community to try and work out what this means. But sometimes we shouldn't miss a forest for the trees. If this parable is about the ten bridesmaids, each with a lantern, let's ask ourselves what a lantern is for. A lantern helps us to see in the dark. And I think there's something about this parable that's wanting to help us to see things, to see things in a world that is often cloaked in shadow. There'll there'll be more to say about the parable in a few minutes, but I want us to keep that in mind. We are being invited to have oil in our lamp so that we can see something that we wouldn't see otherwise. Which brings us to our other reading from, from 1 Thessalonians. And this is one of the most 
um, ill-translated passages or misconceived passages of Scripture that's, I can't think of one that's been taken so out of context and used in so many unhelpful ways. This passage is often talked about in reference to what we, in our popular culture today, call the apocalypse. And when we think of the word apocalypse, I'm sure most of us think of something like this, or maybe with a zombie or two in the background somewhere. We think about the end of the world and everything going pear-shaped and everything's blowing up. But of course, that's not what the apocalypse is at all. This is a great thing that Hollywood has done. It's sold a lot of movies and it's all fun and full of adventure, but it has very little to do with the witness of Scripture. There was a book series that came out probably about 20 years ago called Left Behind, and some really bad movies were made from it as well. And the whole point of this, this uh, fictionalized account that is meant to have some connection with Scripture, is that the world is going to end, but the Christians are going to be whisked away. A bit like Beam Me Up, Scotty, from Star Trek, you know? They're going to be zapped away, and so we've got this picture of this suit here, a guy's having a, having a coffee, and suddenly the end of the world's coming, so all the Christians are, are taken away. They won't have to suffer the cataclysmic events that are about to happen. Um, and... The reason that I'm mentioning this is in this passage from Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, try and say that with a speech impediment, that's difficult enough as it is, 1 Thessalonians talks about people meeting Jesus in the sky. But again, we've just talked about some of the passages in Scripture are metaphorical, Sometimes it's obvious to know what, the, what those passages are. Others, it's a bit more difficult to discern. We need to read with some intelligence here to see what Paul is saying to us. If we were to take this kind of reading literally, it's saying the world is coming to a cataclysmic end. Everything's going to blow up. And people often put this passage from Thessalonians alongside passages from the book of Revelation, alongside passages from from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, they say everything's going to go south, last one out, turn out the lights, but it's okay because us Christians are are going to be looked after because Jesus is going to take us away and we won't have to suffer along with everyone else. Think through what that narrative is saying. What is that saying about a loving God? What is that saying about the command of Jesus to love your enemies? What is that saying about the nature of forgiveness What is that saying about God's promise of renewing the earth? The end of the world is not about destruction. The end that we are going towards, that train that we are heading, that we are passengers on, that that future that awaits us is one of healing, is one of restoration, is one of reconciliation. Paul writes elsewhere in the New Testament that those who are ministers of Christ are ministers of reconciliation that all things will be made new once more. This isn't about the end of the world. This is about a new beginning for hope and love and peace. And that may seem impossible for us to even imagine when we think of divided communities that we we see on the news in the US. And we think, what does healing even look like there? And I can understand many people who think, let's just pull the pin Let's just get out. This is, this is too hard. We don't have to worry about reconciliation and forgiveness and peace because Jesus is coming back. He's going to blow the whole thing up. That's not the Christian story. And that's not what this passage in 1 Thessalonians is telling us. The word apocalypse does not mean destruction. It means revelation. That's literally what it means. It means drawing back the curtain to see what's behind. It's like, you know, 2,000 years before The Wizard of Oz was written, it's saying, let's draw back the curtain and see what's happening here. Who's in control? Who's pulling the levers? What's going on behind the scenes? Apocalyptic literature is written in a way that's fanciful and it's exciting and it's dramatic and it draws us in, but the symbols and the, the narrative is meant to challenge us to see the world differently, to light that lantern, to see what is hidden in the dark. So when it comes to this particular passage in 1 Thessalonians, let us 
be, familiarize ourselves with the context. Some scholars think this may actually be the first letter that Paul has written. Probably in the early 50s. Jesus was crucified and rose again around the year 33, around that time. So about 20 years later, some of the first followers of Jesus are starting to die. People are expecting Jesus to come back at any time, and yet people are dying, and they're thinking, what will happen if people die before Jesus comes back? And so Paul writes this letter to encourage and give comfort to the early church. And he says, don't be afraid. Jesus is coming back. He's going to come back into the clouds, and we're all going to go up to meet him. But the word that's used here is the Greek word parousia. It's a word that is used to describe those who would go out of the city to meet the king who is about to arrive. So there's a, the, imagine the guy in the watchtower sees the king and the motorcade in the contemporary setting, and they're coming towards the city. The city would send out a delegation to meet the king, and not to go off to a hill somewhere, but to come back into the city. The idea of this passage is we go to meet Jesus in the sky, not to be whisked off to Mars somewhere, but to come back down to earth. Because this is where the new kingdom will come. This is where the renewing of creation will begin. The whole idea is not to be raptured, to escape. It's not the, the eternal eject button. The whole idea of the parousia is we meet Jesus to come back so we can be a part of what Christ is doing in renewing the earth. Imagine you've invited someone for dinner and you hear the doorbell ring and you meet them at the front door and they're all dressed up and they're ready to come in and you say, it's okay, the house is a mess, we're going out tonight. That's not what this passage is about. This passage is you meet them at the front door and you welcome them in because everything is well prepared. You've been cooking all day. You've been tidying up the place. You may have hidden a few things under the sofa so no one sees, but the place is well prepared. That's what this passage is about. And this is the connection it has for us for the parable of the lanterns. It's about eschatology. Eschatology is one of those complicated theological words which literally means the last things or, or the end of things. But when we think of the end of things, it doesn't necessarily mean a, con a conclusion. It can mean the meaning. The question for esch eschatological conversation is, what's it all been about? The king is coming back. Jesus is, re is returning. What have we been doing? What's, what's it all been about anyway? Is church just about gathering together, sing some songs, pat each other on the back, have some, some nice morning tea, we can't even do that during COVID, and then wander off for the rest of the week only to return next Sunday? No. The Christian community, the Christian faith is about preparing for the return of the king. So that when the king returns, we don't just take off somewhere, we welcome the return of the king and the restoration of the world can begin. Eschatology is about new beginnings as much as it is about things coming to an end. The Christian narrative, the baptism we had this morning, the symbolism, if, if Carter had been an adult and we had had the River Jordan here, Carter would have gone under the water to say the old life had ended and come back up out of the water to say a new life has begun. There's something es eschatological about that. So when it comes to the parable of the lanterns, and we could spend a lot of time unpacking this, but I think the take-home message is simply this. Be prepared. A friend of mine from years ago used to have a, um, a T-shirt that said, Jesus is coming back. Quick, look busy. The kingdom of God is upon us. Christ is returning. Are we prepared? What does that preparation look like? In the book of Micah, it spells it out in the Old Testament, before they even knew who this Christ was, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly before God. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. That is how people will know who you are, if you love one another. That's the preparation for the kingdom, that Christ might return. And to set the cat amongst the pigeons here, 
because we always find this in Scripture. One passage almost seems to contradict another. Keep in mind the competing symbolism and what the narrative is telling us. We find at the beginning of the book of Acts, after Jesus has ascended, the the story tells us Jesus literally ascends and the community gathers around. That's the narrative. And the disciples are left staring up at the sky. And then an angel comes alongside of them. Remember the word angel means messenger. A messenger from God comes alongside them and says, what are you doing staring up at the sky? Jesus isn't coming back by the sky. Jesus is coming back the same way that he left. Now some people might say, but he left by going up in the sky. But the purpose of the story is to say, no, he left by way of the cross. That is how he will return, by way of the cross. That is how we prepare for the coming of Christ, by way of the cross. If we want to prepare well for the return of Christ, we do the things that Jesus did. We love the poor. We love the rejected. We love the sinners because we discover that we are the sinners. We love our neighbors. We love our enemies. We forgive those who have injured us. We become peacemakers wherever God calls us, and we have our lanterns ready, primed with oil, to shine light into dark places that we may all learn to see the things that are hidden, that love and grace are everywhere. If only God would open our eyes. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that little Carter has been welcomed into a family of Christ and that his eyes will be opened to see the world differently. Thank you, God, for our community here, that you will help us to have our lanterns ready. You will help us to see unfiltered a world that at times can be confusing that we would see love and we would see grace and we would see mercy, that we would see justice even as we are preparing for it. Help us to be part of what you are doing, God, that your imagination may enliven ours and that we may be faithful to the calling upon us that we would become the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.